Okay, hello everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, welcome to our final East Central European Ce um, Center event of the semester. Um, I'm glad you're with us. My name is Christopher Case. I'm the co-director of the East Central European Center. And my co-director, um, Alexander Boschkovich, is with us as well. You'll have the opportunity to see him in a moment. Um, he will handle the moderation section of our event today, which I'll be introducing. Um, and the event today um, is entitled Archives of Solidarity, uh, Yugoslav Newsreels and the Non-Aligned World. And we are very fortunate to welcome to our event today uh, award-winning documentary filmmaker Mila Turajlic. Uh, Mila Turajlic has an extraordinary accomplished and diverse background. She is currently a fellow at Columbia University's Paris-based Institute for Ideas and Imagination. So in a sense, she's coming to us from us. She is currently one of us, and we're happy to welcome her to this event um, and to Columbia University. Um, she holds an MA in Politics and International Relations from London School of Economics and a PhD in Cinema Studies from University of Westminster, and her teaching at various European archival and documentary film institutes involves the exploration of the creative use of archival material for contemporary documentary filmmaking. Um, and it is as a documentary filmmaker in her own right for which um, Mila is best known. Um, her debut feature, uh, her debut feature documentary film, Cinema Communisto, um, from 2011, played at over 100 festivals worldwide and won 16 awards, including the Golden Hugo at the Chicago um, Film Festival for um, international, uh, Best International Documentary. It also received the Focal uh, Trade Association Award for Creative Use of Archival Footage. Her most recent film, The Other Side of Everything, focusing on um, life in war-torn Serbia uh, through a lens constructed around her own family. I should mention that her first uh, film, Cinema Communisto, uh, focused on the, uh, sh the, the role of cinema in shaping the identity of the former Yugoslavia. So her work focuses on, um, on Yugoslavia and the role of film in the sort of representation and, I suppose, intervention into that culture. Um, the other side of everything, her most recent film uh, was HBO's was HBO Europe's first co-production with Serbia, winning no less than 32 awards, including best um, international documentary. I'm sorry, best documentary at the International Documentary Film Festival of Amsterdam. It also received the Grand Prix for best historical documentary released in France in 2018, um, and it also received the International Documentary Association's award for best writing. So, uh, quite an extraordinary. Um, series of awards and accomplishments to uh, Mila's credit uh, in her background. It's her third major film project that she will be discussing with us today. We're very excited to hear about it. It's entitled The Labudovich Reels, and it focuses on um, an extraordinary discovery made uh, by Mila, uh, Stevan Labudovich, who was uh, President Tito's own um, cinematographer, as I understand it. Um, was sent by him or acted as an emissary or was tasked with representing various liberation movements in Africa and the Third World. And Mila has discovered the unreleased or undeveloped um, um, footage of this material shot by Stevan Labudovic uh, in the archives in Yugoslavia. I'm sorry, in the former Yugoslavia. Um, I think it's an extraordinary opportunity for us to um, hear about and be involved in since um, Unusually, it involves a series of dialogues between the former Eastern Europe or East Central Europe and a different part of the world not filtered through, um, say, the U.S. or the Soviet Union, the non-allied movement itself. So we have the opportunity to hear about not East-West dialogue um, or even East-East dialogue, but East-South dialogue. Um, and so um, uh, I think it's a, a sort of a, a neat dimension which will be opened up to us here as we think about uh, our own region that we focus on and its relationships to other parts of the world. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over um, to Mila Turajlic. Um, welcome to our event. Thank you for being with here, here with us, and um, we hope that all is well in Colombia, in Paris. And um, please feel free to go ahead and share with us what you have prepared for today. Thank you, Christopher, for the introduction. And thank you, Alexander, for the invitation. I'm really kind of delighted to bridge now the work I'm doing at the Columbia Institute in, in Paris with what you're doing at the Harriman Institute. And I've decided to, to frame the presentation of my work really 
kind of in according to what I think, you know, the audience might be that that kind of follows your events. So as you said, I'm going to be talking about um, a research project that I've been working on for five years now, uh, the ultimate result of which will be a feature length documentary film. But as you'll see by the end of the presentation, over time, this has grown into a much bigger artistic and research project than just one film. And, uh, and I'm really looking forward to sharing actually that work with you because I come at it from a documentary filmmaker's perspective, obviously. And so it's really interesting. I'm looking forward to the, to the conversation that we can have afterwards around the work. So I'm gonna share my screen. And hopefully you can see the presentation. Great. Um, and as we were talking with Alexander about the title of the presentation, we came up with this idea of really trying to use as the starting point of the actual work that I've been working in the archives of the Yugoslav newsreels. Um, I felt like I would start with a visual slide um, giving you an idea of the archives today. So this is the depot of the Yugoslav newsreels, an institution called the uh, Filmske Novosti. And in some ways, the way I've been working with this archive, and I started working there already researching for my first film, Cinema Comunisto. So I've had a relationship with them that goes back 15 years now. What is really interesting is that at the time that I arrived to work there in 2005 for the first time, they were uh, still a federal institution, but we were no longer a federation. And so they found, um, as many other institutions in the former Yugoslavia, they found themselves in a, in a kind of legal vacuum, meaning that there was no political body that could appoint a new director of the institution. And so from the outset, I felt that I was working with archive that was in a legal sense orphaned, um, but also in an ideological sense, because it had fallen out of the ideological narratives that were framing our political conversations in 2006. Yugoslavia, as many of you know, was a, a chapter in our history that was written out by the successive nationalist governments in almost every post-Yugoslav state. And it was really from this perspective of an archive that was abandoned um, by, the, by official public memory, if you like, that I began working with these images that were forgotten during the breakup of Yugoslavia and in many ways erased from our public memory. Um, as well as, I should say, historically, Yugoslavia's central role in the creation of the non-aligned movement. So I started working with images that had been unseen and unexplored for decades, really due to lack of public interest or political interest in their content. Um, but in order to frame that story, but because of this ruptured narrative that I said, I want to take you back to another image, um, all the way back to the Second World War, maybe one of the most defining images of the Yugoslav resistance um, to fascism during the Second World War, which is the image of Josip Broz Tito wounded in battle. And he often claimed this is a badge of honor that he was the only allied leader in the Second World War to have been wounded in the field. And I wanted to start with this image because this is the image that audiences in Yugoslavia, but also internationally would have had of Tito at the time that our story begins. I think it's very important to situate that because obviously with the successive evolutions, of his image in the public imagination. Sometimes we tend to forget that this was in many ways uh, in terms of his um, public personality, the defining image of who he was. And so just to situate those of you who wouldn't necessarily know the historical chapter that I'm working on, um, Yugoslavia enjoyed a pretty specific diplomatic position uh, starting from 1948, because after the break with Stalin, and its expulsion from the Soviet bloc, Yugoslavia found itself diplomatically adrift in Europe, if I may say so, between East and West, but it was not necessarily a country interested in pursuing a neutral policy, which is how it came that President Tito went on a series of voyages outside of Europe, seeking to forge new political alliances. And here you can see a map of voyages that were taken by Tito by ship over a period of about two decades after at one point he started traveling by plane instead of by ship. But it's just to give you an idea that from 1954, Tito set out on a series of voyages of peace, oftentimes lasting two to three months, um, visiting countries that were newly emerging from colonialism or that were, uh, they were beginning to chart their own path on the international stage. And some of them he would visit many, many times, such as Egypt, um, and India, 
others he would visit only once, but it is in this period of time that Tito began to forge an image of a leader at the heart of the non-aligned project. And this image would extend all the way to, and I think this is a really interesting summary of how recognizable that image would become for countries um, in the global south. This is a bank note issued in Guinea for the 20th anniversary of their independence, and it features President Tito's face. So it was just, again, using images to explore how present he was in the public, popular imagination of um, not only politicians at the time, but also of um, audiences. And so my work has centered around films Kinovosti. They often refer, refer to themselves as Yugoslav newsreels and international correspondents. So I've kind of taken up this, um, this translation. And I think it is incredibly important to say that films Kinovosti were a state newsreel agency. They were created in 1945, but their origins go back to the film section of the partisan units in the Second World War. And it is this partisan heritage that will largely shape the work that they will do uh, across uh, countries in Africa. And we'll get to that further on in the presentation. But the other thing that is incredibly important to highlight about their position is that they were the only film studio in the former Yugoslavia that was directly answerable to the executive branch of the federal government, which is to say that they were under direct political control and supervision. And they were tasked with the job of producing weekly newsreels special thematic issues, as well as documentary films, all of which were legally mandated to be shown in cinemas all across Yugoslavia uh, prior to the screenings of feature films. And as you can see from this image that I took of a film strip in Films Kinalosti, President Tito's image heavily dominated the newsreels out of uh, more than 2000 newsreel stories that were produced by Yugoslav newsreels in the period of socialist Yugoslavia, President Tito's activities uh, were the subject of more than half. So again, to say how already through the creation of the newsreels and their operations, um, they were absolutely harnessed to the construction of President, uh, President Tito's public um, image and, uh, and in some ways at the beginning of his personality cult, if you like. So again, I think maybe just to historically situate you, the 1950s are definitely what could be called the newsreel era in terms of being the dominant visual information medium for most audiences globally, not just in Yugoslavia. And in many ways, when you look at scholars who write about uh, the impact and the importance of newsreels in that period, people like Pierre Sarlin, they tend to emphasize the ability of the newsreels to fix imprecise events in public's minds because they would be shown them, but also that they were unique in the fact that this was the only place where audiences at large could see the living bodies of their leaders. Um, and as I mentioned before, because they were legally mandated to be shown in cinemas, in some ways they had a captive audience at a time of peak cinema attendance. So it's incredibly important to understand just how prevalent and, and influential they were as a communication medium, which is why I'm focusing so much on the work that they did in the 1950s and the 1960s. But one other thing that is important to say at the outset is that um, the newsreels were part of in a large uh, system of interna international exchange. So the Yugoslav newsreels joined the International Newsreel Association already in 1957. And so I just pulled out some statistics in order to give you an idea of the volume of exchange that was going on between countries. And I would also highlight unexpected maybe exchanges. So in 1958, Films Kinovosti sent 406 newsreel stories abroad to 29 different countries. But what is important to say is that exchanges with countries such as Japan or India or um, the United Arab Republic, which was Egypt and Syria at the time, rivaled those with immediate neighbor countries like Italy, Bulgaria, and Austria, which is maybe counterintuitive. I don't know that people would imagine that the newsreels traveled so far. And it was also in this year that a newsreel story was exchanged for the first time with newly independent countries such as Morocco and Tunisia, as well as countries in Latin America, such as Argentina and Uruguay. And if you look at the documents tracing the international newsreel exchange, some of which I found in the archives of the Yugoslav newsreels, but some of which I found in the archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they had an absolute idea that they were using these films for, if you like, um, um, soft power, 
for, for shaping the image of Yugoslavia internationally. And there's a quote that I pulled from one of these reports by the Ministry of Information, which says the expert of our films is the expert of our reality. And for Yugoslavia at that time in the 1950s, the expert of their reality was something that they heavily invested in because there was this constant feeling as a country that was in neither block that they had to define and redefine their position um, on, on the international stage. And so picking up the story where I had introduced it, when President Tito decided to go on his voyages of peace, obviously due to the importance of the newsreel, a plan was immediately hatched to create a film crew that would accompany him and that would film these voyages. And so the two men that you see in these photos, in this photo are Dragan Mitrovic and Stevan Labudovic, both cameramen of Filmski Novosti, both with experience of um, working in the partisan photographic units during the Second World War. So both coming from a partisan background and both uh, winners of prizes as the best correspondents uh, in the system of um, the Yugoslav newsreels across the former Yugoslavia, so incredibly talented cameramen. And uh, as uh, they boarded the ship, they had a, a clear mission, which was to send at every stop along the way, send back reels of what they had filmed. And, these, and this material was incorporated within the weekly newsreel reports that came out in cinemas in Yugoslavia. And so in some ways, as you saw before, because Tito was traveling sometimes for two or three months at a time, it was through these weekly newsreel reports that they maintained the illusion of Tito's continued presence in Yugoslavia because the audiences were following his trip in some ways, in, if you like, in real time. At the end of each voyage, a special documentary film would be edited from all the footage. And this film was not only shown in cinemas in Yugoslavia, but was distributed and released internationally. And oftentimes it was used and sent to countries as an advanced campaign for Tito's next voyage. So to set up his arrival and create a film program during his stay. So there's a real use value to these film materials. They're not just chronicles or documents at the time. They're already very, very clearly um, profiled as uh, films that are part of the political strategy and they're part of the political campaign that Tito is leading by going on the voyages of peace. Um, the voyages took place, as I mentioned, on a ship called Galib. Uh, the ship exists still today. Um, this is a still from the footage that I filmed with Stevan Labudovic, so one of the two cameramen that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, when I started making a documentary film about him uh, about six years ago, so uh, I spent about three years working with Stevan Labudovic on the project of a documentary film about him. But for me, it was really a way of using his life story and his career trajectory, if you like, for an exploration of Yugoslavia's use of the cinematic image and international diplomacy, and particularly related to the non-aligned movement. The Galeb, just for um, those who are interested, had a pretty strange destiny after the breakup of Yugoslavia um, and after a lot of aborted attempts to deal with its fate, including a failed uh, auction to private owner, it was recently purchased by the city of Rijeka, where it was last in harbor. And the current project is currently actually no longer in the port of Rijeka, it is currently being refurbished with um, the plan of turning it into a floating museum of which one part of the, the story of the exhibition will be dedicated to Tita's Voyages of Peace and the other part will be a hostel, so it'll be accommodating um, travelers as well. And I've been working with the museum actually filming interviews with sailors who traveled on Tito's voyages of peace and other witnesses of that time in order to create the materials for this for this exhibition. But moving along, as I mentioned, my relationship with Stevan Labudovic started by trying to understand the role that he had performed as a cameraman who had been assigned to follow President Tito in all these voyages. And one of the things that struck me when I began my research with him was, for example, finding this poster. And this is the poster for the second uh, voyage of peace, the one from 1959. And as you can see on the poster, it says cameraman Dragan Mitri Stevan Labudovic, but as the director of the film, somebody else's name is signed. And this is when I began to understand that the process of authorship of this material was a lot more complicated than I had initially imagined. Because Stevan Labudovic and Dragan Mitrovic were indeed the cameramen who were assigned to film these materials. 
But because they were sending the materials back while they were still on the voyage, they weren't actually the authors of the piece, uh, which was actually shaped in consultation with a large group of people that included not only the director and the editor and the editor in chief of the newsreels, but also various government institutions from the federal executive branch of the government and the Committee for Ideological Questions to the actual cabinet of the President of the Republic and the Department of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that was in charge of communication and propaganda. So these were truly collaborative efforts, completely politically influenced, as you will see later on, I'll show you some examples. But I think this is a really necessary prism through which to understand the resulting films, which is something that I hadn't really realized when I began my work with Labudovic. And this is, for example, one document that I found going through his archives, which basically says, Dragan Mitrovic, Stevan Labudovic, upon their return from Ethiopia and Egypt in 1956, they created a scene on the premises of Filmski Novosti, visibly demonstrating their dissatisfaction with the material in the newsreels. So this is when I began to realize that there was another way to start working through this documentary material, which is to try and introduce the subjective gaze of the man who had filmed it. And so here you have a still from material that I filmed with Stevan Labudovic at his home, where I began going with him through his personal documentation, personal letters and personal diaries in order to layer all of this archive with another interpretation or another reading, which is a very subjective one, but basically his own gaze as the person who was there, who was filming, who was making decisions in the field and in that way crafting the material. And it was a very long process because Stevan had been assigned to travel with Tito in 1954, but he performed this role until President Tito's death in 1980. So we were trying to cover a period of uh, almost 30 years of his activities as the president's cameraman. And oftentimes for me, it was really about trying to understand how much agency he had in the field, how much he felt that he could film on his own, how much he managed to get into the material um, of his own observations, even though this material would not be edited into the newsreels or would not be visible to us because it's drowned out by these voiceovers that were written by the political um, institutions involved in making the final films. But one thing that I did realize after several years of working with Stevan is that in an interesting way, his career actually traverses the entire line of events that lead to the creation of the non-aligned movement. Um, so not only was he present for every single one of Tito's voyages to Asia and Africa, and hence he recorded Tito's first meeting with other leaders of the non-aligned movement. So Tito's first meeting with Prime Minister Nehru in India, Tito's first meeting in encounter with President Nasser of Egypt, or his first encounter with President Sukarno in Indonesia. He was also the person who had filmed the famous meeting of Tito Nasser and Nehru on the Brioni Islands in Yugoslavia in 1956, after which he filmed what is, perhaps, what is in fact the first public joint appearance of the non-aligned leaders on the world stage, uh, the famous Initiative of Five meeting that took place during the United Nations General Assembly in New York in 1960, which united Tito Nasser, Nehru, Sukarno, and Nkrumah of Ghana for the first time at the Yugoslav mission. But he was also the cameraman who was put in charge of making the only color film um, that exists of the 1961 Belgrade summit, which has later became known as the summit, um, the first non-aligned summit, if you want, or the moment of the creation of the non-aligned movement. So this is when I began to develop this idea for a film that would use the cameraman's perspective and his trajectory as a way of telling the story of the birth of the non-aligned movement. Um, and oftentimes it gave me very interesting glimpses into the material because here, for example, you see Stevan running in the bushes on Brioni during the meeting, but it helped me obtain a kind of different reading um, of the images that he had filmed and, and beginning to understand how these visual media was used in order to pass messages of um, diplomacy. And... Uh, Using his material, I began to deconstruct in some ways how Yugoslavia had used cultural diplomacy as part of its influence building strategies in order to establish its position in the non-aligned world. So here I've taken two screenshots from material filmed by Stevan Labudovic 
during Tito's visit to um, the uh, African country of Guinea in 1961, where you can see that there was a lot of emphasis put on public information panels with photographs of Tito and Secuture um, and Tito's in Secuture's visit to Yugoslavia. But you can also see on the right that Stefan is actually filming a poster advertising a week of Yugoslav cinema that is being shown at the same time as uh, on the occasion of Tito's visit to Guinea. And they're actually on the program, you can see that they're showing other films that were shot by Stevan Labudovic. So there's a kind of cyclical meta reference here of him filming um, the showing of his own films, if you like, in Africa. And I began to think that it is incredibly interesting um, sign of how aware they all were of the kind of utilitarian value of the material they were, they were filming. And um, this extends to other documentation that I found. So for example, this is a document tracing the creation of a film called Guests from Africa, which was a film that was specifically made in order to be shown during Tito's voyage to Africa um, and was also gifted to the heads of state that he visited during that trip along with a film projector that would enable them to show this film. And so if you look at this document, uh, this is a document signed uh, directly from the cabinet of the president of the Republic. And it says, make sure that the shot of President Tito greeting Ibrahim Aboud of Sudan is not more affectionate than the shots of the meeting between President Tito and Nasser. So it shows all of the complexity of portraying the diplomatic relations um, between Yugoslavia and, and various countries. But it also says, and this is what I what it takes us to the next chapter of Stevan's story, highlight the most important aspects of our assistance to the fight of the Algerian people, wounded soldiers, students, aid to refugees, which is very popular in African countries. And the mention of the Algerian war actually brings me to how I met Stevan in the first place. So bizarrely enough, even though both Stevan and I lived in Belgrade, we actually met in Algiers. We met in Algiers during the Festival of Engaged Cinema uh, in 2014, uh, because I was there with my first film, Cinema Comunisto, and Stefan was there as the festival's guest of honor. And the reason he was there as the festival guest of honor is that in Algeria, Stefan is considered the cinematic eye of the Algerian revolution. And for me, this actually opens a whole other chapter uh, of the cinematic use um, uh, of, uh, of the image um, in, in the struggle for African decolonization that goes a lot, lot further than this chapter of the voyages of peace and this idea of creating portraits of newly independent countries. So to introduce you to how this story happened, a very brief um, recap, basically, the Algerian Liberation War began on the 1st of November, 1954. By uh, 1959, it had become the defining uh, armed struggle uh, for decolonization in Africa. And in 1959, in the summer of 1959, Tito received a delegation of the Algerian Provisional Government, which was on an international tour seeking to find allies and recognition for their cause. And the defining image of that visit is the front page of the El Mujahid, which was the, if you like, the organ of the, of the Algerian liberation movement, which shows President Tito presenting the Algerian fighters with a rifle. So it's a visual gesture symbolizing the transmission of the torch of revolutionary resistance, because obviously Tito was known as a successful leader of a guerrilla resistance movement. Um, but it's also the passing from clandestine support to public backing. And it's a move that Tito would pay for politically because ultimately would lead to France uh, rupturing diplomatic relations with Yugoslavia. But at the time it meant that Yugoslavia became the first European pub, uh, country to publicly recognize the Algerian liberation movement and to take, to take their side, if you like. And so as a result of this visit, um, many different forms of Yugoslav aid were agreed upon, including the sending of arms and uh, uniforms and um, other forms of aid. But essentially what's important for this story is that one of the things that was agreed on is that Seven Labudovic would be sent 
to Algeria to make a documentary film about the Algerian Liberation Army. And what is interesting is that in a, in a kind of twist of events, what was supposed to be a three month visit became a three year commitment by Stevan Labudovic to film the activities of the Algerian Liberation Army and to document the war. And I found one letter after a few weeks uh, of his stay um, where the head of Yugoslav Newsreels writes to the Alger leaders of the Algerian Liberation army saying we have a problem here because our cameraman has, has become your chronicler and so he had a, he had initially arrived in Algeria to make a film about the Algerian liberation struggle based on a script um, his status there changed very quickly because even though the whole project was agreed with the political arm of the movement the Algerian liberation front he was actually embedded within the army and this is an incredibly important distinction because one it heavily determined the kind of access he had to the troops. And two, because by the end of the war, the political and the military um, arm of the movement actually came into conflict with each other, um, his footage was recuperated later on by the army. And so just to say that he spent extended shooting periods after independence in Algeria, and also due to the fact that he filmed in nine different uh, battalions during the three years that he spent filming the war, um, he actually formed a very close and personal relationship with two successive Algerian pres presidents. And in some ways, all of this is to say that his role for many decades to come would extend beyond the purely cinematic to being also a very important diplomatic role. Um, and he often acted as a diplomatic channel between the Yugoslav government and the Algerian government. And so I, after this initial encounter with Seven in Algiers, I would spend uh, the last three years uh, traveling quite often to Algeria, seeking to film um, witness accounts um, by people who had been involved in the cinematic effort of the Algerian Liberation Army. So here in the photo on the left, you can see Stevan Labudovic in uniform um, and his camera, which was an RE 35 millimeter camera uh, being held by uh, Huari Boumedienne, who at the time was at the head of the um, army general staff, if you like, and would later on become president of Algeria. And one of the most important witnesses or actors in the story, if you like, who I managed to get access to in film uh, several times was the man who had been put in charge by Boumedienne to create the cinema section of the political commissariat of the Liberation Army. Ferhat Siberahal. And it was really in working with him that I began to understand the strategy behind Stevan's presence in Algeria and the strategy of the ALN's use of his cinematic images. Um, so two years into the war in 1956, the Algerian Liberation Front basically changed their strategy, um, adopting something called the Sumam platform, um, in which basically they began to put the political struggle over and above the military struggle, uh, being faced with the fourth largest army in the world, um, they, they knew pretty well that they wouldn't win the war militarily in the field. And so they began to use cinema for a double purpose. One was in an instructional recruiting role in the movement themselves, so helping them to gain new supporters among the population. And the second was in an informational diplomatic role, which is to communicate with the outside world by informing people of events that were taking place and by arguing their own right to self-determination. And so the first product of the cinema section of the Algerian Liberation Army was a film created on the basis of images shot by Stevan Labudovic, but also other cameramen who were shooting in Algeria at the time. But the film was edited in Belgrade. The title of the film is Does Erona, translated as Our Algeria. And uh, I include a quote here from a professor at the History Department of Columbia, actually, who did a lot of work on this idea of diplomatic revolutions, um, saying the war was not primarily won or lost on the ground, but through political maneuvering. Militarily, the French effectively reduced the FLN's guerrilla force. Politically, however, the French lost the war because they failed to recognize that the battle they needed to win was that of ideas. The FLN, cognizant of its weaknesses in the face of overwhelming French military power, restructured the geometry of the conflict around international opinion, bypassing official representatives to make their cases before 
foreign publics, opinion makers, and the media. And in some ways, I see Jezeiruna, which is a film that was completed in the summer of 1960, as a kind of predecessor of what would ultimately become by the late 1960s, the whole movement of third cinema, which is this idea of a cinematographic third worldism of filmmakers traveling to countries um, that were hoping to rely on cinema as a, in the creation of a militant image, one that would serve to both recruit and uh, affect international opinion. Um, and it really forms the basis of this ideology of a cinema of intervention. Um, I found documents that trace the entire collaboration between Yugoslav, um, the Yugoslav um, newsreels and uh, the people engaged in the creation of the films within the political movement and the army uh, on the Algerian side. For example, this is a telegram from the summer of 1960. So during the period of making of Jazeiro now, which says Tula Budovic, Rashid arrived and began work. The old material is good. We'll inform about new when it's developed. Opinion here is it would be good for Bumangel or one of leaders to come to redact the film. So it's important, I, I included this document because I thought it was really important to highlight the fact that the Algerian political leadership was heavily involved in the creation of these films, particularly in their editing and in the writing of the voiceovers for the film. Um, Ahmed Boumangel uh, was a lawyer who had been um, instrumental in negotiating uh, the creation of the film between the Algerian leadership and Yugoslav newsreels, and was also um, politically in charge of the publishing of the bulletin that you saw, the El Mujahid. So someone who was deeply involved in, in the creation of um, the FLN's um, political strategy. And so summer of 1960, Stevan Labudovic, as you can see from this telegram, is in Algeria when he actually gets recalled to return to Belgrade because President Tito makes the decision to travel and attend the General Assembly of the United Nations. And so Labudovic is pulled from Algeria in order to accompany Tito on his visit to New York. And according to him, um, this was the moment in which he decided to take a copy of Jezeruna that they were just completing with him and bring it with him to New York. Um, it wasn't an ordinary general assembly that Tito decided to attend. It was actually the biggest gathering of heads of state that, was, that had ever taken place um, in the history of the United Nations. But it was also the year in which 16 new countries, new African countries were inducted into the membership of the UN. So it was a, it was a very important gathering, if you like, of new and emerging leaders in New York, which is the reason why Life magazine called it the biggest show on earth at the time. And so when Labudovic arrived in New York, he sought out the representatives of the Algerian liberation movement who had created a media office in New York, um, because they were trying, as mentioned previously, to win the battle in the arena of images. And because the French were using a US communications firm to organize screenings and, and kind of propagate their media version of the events that were taking place in Algeria, the Algerians put in place um, a media office in New York. And it is to the Minister of Information, Mohamed Yazid, that Stevan would hand over a copy of Jazeirona and they would organize a screening during the United Nations General Assembly of the, of the film which is just to, to show the kind of direct link between the creation of the films and their use. Stevan would film one other important event in New York, which I mentioned previously, which is this initiative of five. And really this photo of the five leaders of the non-aligned countries standing at the bottom of this staircase of the Yugoslav mission in New York has over time become the image that kind of embodies um, the spirit of the non-aligned and uh, their five leaders. And, and, and you could say that this is the moment when visually the non-aligned initiative gets constituted um, thanks, to, thanks to the gathering that took place in New York. The non-aligned, uh, at the time not called that, but the initiative of five would try and present a joint resolution to the United Nations General Assembly, which was outvoted. And it's as a direct result, uh, I would say, is the of the failure of this resolution in New York that a year later they decided to convene a meeting in Belgrade before the UN General Assembly in a way to adopt a common platform. And this is how the Belgrade summit takes place. One year later, after the meeting of five, um, 
in the first days of September 1961, so exactly 60 years ago, and the Serbian government recently organized uh, an event to commemorate the fact that it was the 60th anniversary. What's important to say, though, is that the Belgrade summit, to me, not only because, it, as you can see, here's Devan Labudovic filming um, President Nasser at the, at the Belgrade summit, uh, is interesting from the perspective of the way Filmskin Novosti covered the summit, but other scholars have gone much further in um, looking at the non-line summits as media events. And one of my favorite quotes actually, that really kind of encompasses the mediatic importance comes from Jürgen Dinkel who wrote, lacking hard power in military or economic terms, the non-line countries tried to achieve their foreign policy aims through increasingly symbolic performative actions, such as symmetry, visual propaganda, geared to, towards the global mass media to influence an assumed world opinion and make their voice heard in international politics. And I've been doing a lot of work on this. I'm gonna skip this part for the sake of brevity, but I've been doing a lot of work on this idea of how they use the summit to make their voice heard. Um, even here, these are screenshots from Stevan's unedited materials. So this is footage that has never been shown publicly, but you can see how avidly the non-aligned leaders are actually consuming the media representations of their appearance at the Belgrade summit during the Belgrade summit. So here you see President Sakarno of Indonesia watching uh, the television broadcast of the summit. And it's important to say that the summit was the first event that was broadcast live by the newly created Yugoslav radio television. And here you see a prime minister Nehru reading a news report in a British newspaper um, of the speech that he had given the previous day at the summit. So again, this kind of way through which um, looking at the film footage gives this meta reading of their own uh, um, awareness and media consumption of, uh, of, their, of their strategies. Um, and so, like I said, I'm gonna skip this part, but just basically to say, we've been working with um, the radio archives in Belgrade to synchronize the material that remains of the Belgrade summit with the sound recordings that were made at the time with this idea of making the non-aligned voices heard uh, six years after the event, but I'm gonna skip So what you saw there is a tiny, tiny, tiny piece of the work that we've recently been doing with the Yugoslav newsreels, which is syncing the sound to the found images in order to be able to make the speeches um, given at the Belgrade summit be heard again. But in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip through that in order to move us to the next part which is again, the use of value of all of this material. So as the Belgrade summit ended, the material that was filmed there was rapidly edited into um, a feature documentary film that was then sent to every country that had participated in the summit. And this is a telegram coming from the Yugoslav embassy in Bamako in Mali, informing the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Yugoslavia that a screening had been organized, organized of the Belgrade conference film in the main cinema in Banaco, and that the film was warmly greeted by uh, 1500 viewers who frequently burst into applause to salute many scenes in the film. And just to say that as a result of this very active um, media engagement by the Yugoslavs, what ultimately happened after the Belgrade summit is that they concluded that of the countries present at the Belgrade conference, 18 of them, don't have any newsreels of their own. And this is where the Yugoslavs really saw their opportunity because as a direct result of um, the show of force, if you like, or the show of their technical skills at the Belgrade summit, they would enter into technical agreements with many countries that had been present at the summit in order to make films um, for them in the ensuing years. So this is just like a very, very rapid summary of the holdings of uh, the Yugoslav newsreels today, which is basically uh, tracing their uh, collaborations established, bilateral collaborations established with various countries in Africa um, uh, for providing cinema as technical aid. So going all the way back to 1954, they produced documentary films for Haile Selassie in Ethiopia. Following the Belgrade summit in 1961, they signed an agreement on uh, technical collaboration with Mali to help them set up their National Cinema Center and ultimately created the first 171 newsreels of the Republic of Mali. 
As I mentioned, 1959, Stavan Labudovich went to Algeria and this opened a whole chapter of cinematic collaboration, which went beyond the creation of Dazairona to the creation of the first five issues of the Algerian newsreels shot by the Algerian cameraman that they had trained in the last months of the war. 1965, they signed an agreement of technical collaboration with Tanzania to help them set up their film unit and created the first 29 issues of the Tanzanian newsreels. 1967, is an incredibly interesting chapter in that they began making films for Frelimo, the Mozambican liberation movement. And in 1970, Stevan Labudovich again would be sent to make a documentary film called Blood and Tears for the Palestinian liberation organization in Yasser Arafat. Now, in the interest of time, I can't go really into the details of any of these collaborations, but I wanted to give you one idea of how Tito was using these cinema collaborations to kind of enhance his standing within the non-aligned movement. So here you have a photo from the third non-aligned summit, which took place in Lusaka in 1970, with Tito receiving representatives of liberation movements of Angola, Mozambique, South Africa, and Namibia. Um, three years prior, the first documentary film about Ferlimo had been made by a Yugoslav cameraman, another cameraman of Filmski Novosti, who you see here on the left, called Dragutin Popovic. And on the right, you can see some of the documentation that I found in the re related to the creation of this film for the Mozambican Liberation Front, saying uh, we received the letter saying that the film was ready and we sent on the recordings because, again, like Stevan Labudovic, Dragotin Popovic was filming without sound. So the sound recordings were furnished by the movements themselves. We hope that the work on the film is now completely finished. And, uh, but it just, again, goes to show the close collaboration and involvement of the political leadership of these liberation movements in the creation and use of the, of the final films. And uh, that kind of leads me to where we are now. So all of this um, history, if you like, has provided the basis for the creation of something we call the Nonline Newsreels Project, which we created in collaboration with the Yugoslav Newsreels. As I mentioned, the first result of this project is going to be the feature length documentary film about Stevan Labudovic. But really the core of the project has become the research of this archive with a very clear goal of projecting the images forward, which is to say via critical writing, um, lecture performances, video installations, exhibitions and online content. And if you're interested in following the destiny of the project and uh, all of its iterations, the website, the web platform that we created to host all these materials is at nonalignednewsreels.com. And so just to kind of summarize what we're trying to do with this archive is really this idea to, first of all, identify and digitize the unused rushes that exist in what you could call the non-aligned collection of film skin honesty. The second is really researching the afterlife of the images meaning not only their use value as I've evoked during the presentation, but also their status today. The third is really this idea of contextualizing the material. So all of the work that I did with Stevan Labudovic for a period of over three years was just one way of establishing a kind of subjective gaze of narrative of the archives that remain in Belgrade today, which are quite fragmented essentially in their nature. And then finally, there's this idea of reusing the images today and um, really not so much as a way of reconstructing the past, but really as a way of emancipating the present. Because for me, there's a really strong political dimension to the work on this project, which is really this idea of um, projecting the Im images forward, um, re-giving voice or political voice to, to the non-aligned and kind of introducing them or reintroducing them in what feels like a very urgent debate today uh, about a possible third way, the reasons for which it was abandoned and failed and which elements of that project are worthy of being resurrected today. And I think maybe this is the, a good place to stop and see if um, there are any questions. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Mila. This, this was such a rich presentation with uh... <laughs> With a 20 years of uh, production, such a rich production of materials. And uh, I, I think there are many facets to your project that uh, probably you didn't have time to cover. And you may also talk about, uh, depending on uh, questions coming from our audience. Um, 
So without much ado, I would just uh, jump in and uh, see because we already have in chat some questions. So um, Yanis uh, Tsaligakis is asking, um, do you get the impression um, that uh, the cultural aid that Yugoslavia was playing the cultural agent of the USSR and the non-alignment was a ruse, a mask to lure foreign leaders to more leftist alliance? When you read the original documents that I've been working with, so I've been working with documents in three archives in the archives of Yugoslavia, the archives of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, um, and the archives of Filmski Novosti, the amount of concern coming from ambassadors to Belgrade of both the USA and the USSR would lead me to think that, I, I, wouldn't, I, I would see that as a pretty simplistic reading of what the non-aligned were about. It's true that um, one of the things that really uh, weakened maybe Tito's position within the non-aligned is that, for example, the day before the beginning of the Belgrade summit, the Soviets detonated an atomic bomb very much as a provocation to the summit. And it's something that Tito didn't condemn in his speech and it kind of really weakened the opening of the conference. But I think it's still a far cry from uh, describing the whole project as a ruse. Mm -hmm. um... And then Ranka Primorac is having a question saying, looking at these images, I'm wondering whether there was a kind of theory of race, implicit or explicit, especially a kind of non-imperial European whiteness inscribed in the Yugoslav newsreels. I'm someone who was born in former Yugoslavia and now teaches African literature at the UK university. Is Tito's whiteness anywhere foregrounded or similar? Thank you. I... I'm absolutely not qualified to answer that question. I, I don't know anything about um, the subject of your study, but it's not something that is brought up. There is, um, I don't see it foregrounded in the images. There is obviously when you look at the images, particularly of Tito's visits to, to Africa, the kind of the pomp and the circumstance of the protocol um, is often very reminiscent of how it would have uh, been performed in colonial times as well. And there's a really fantastic research that's been done by historian Radina Vucetic on that subject on how the newly independent countries in Africa kind of adopted colonial protocols and representations. But I can tell you last week, for example, we did a workshop with a series of Ghanaian scholars um, and archivists looking at, for example, the footage of Tito's trip to Ghana and Interestingly enough, none of that came up in the conversation. It was very much about how newly created Ghana, and Tito was one of the first leaders, if not the first European leader to visit Ghana and when it obtained the independence. But it was really a lot about how they were reviving their own traditions um, as gestures of welcome for, for the dignitary. And so, to be honest, I couldn't go into an analysis of that kind because it never came up either in Stevens' own recollections or his perception in any of the documents that I've worked with. And like I said, in any of the opinions that I've solicited from people in those countries, when I show them these archives, our conversations tend to go in another direction. I kind of don't feel that that's the thing that they are, um, that they're reading or focused on in the images. It's really about how their country after independence chose to represent itself. What was the way that they chose to stage um, their their traditions um, to to kind of a, a first visiting head of state. Yeah, thank you for answering that one. Um, and then from the same uh, person from Yanis, we have um, another question. Do you think that the Yugoslav war of the early 1990s, but also the uprisings and constant internal in-flight infighting in the countries of North Africa, is colonial payback for independence? I think it's really worth reading Vijay Prashad's um, um, Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, because he breaks down um, how, where we got to in the late 80s and early 90s as a result of both internal and external factors. So he would call one of the external factors sabotage, you know, sab if you like, by imperial centers. But I think what's really rich and valuable in his um, analysis is that that, that that is not the only, or maybe not even the determining factor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, 
<laughs> I'll continue with the same from the same person. Um, so I'm curious as to what was the reception of Tito's non-aligned campaign within Yugoslavia? Were the critics during the Tito's tenure, but also afterwards? Afterwards. Um, one really interesting, I mean, I'm not a historian, I'm a filmmaker, so, you know, it, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer any of these questions, to be honest, but the reading that I've done around um, the materials is that um, one, of the, one of the arguments that really spoke to me, uh, something advanced by Tvrtko Jakovina, who's written a lot about third worldism in Yugoslavia, again, a historian, all I'm doing is quoting historians here, because I really think that they're the ones who should be answering your questions, um, but he points out the fact that there was a real internal reason for this foregrounding of equality and brotherhood among uh, Yugoslavs in other countries of the global south and that it served to solidify the concept of brotherhood and unity within Yugoslavia. So the whole idea was that the way in which the Yugoslav newsreels or other official narratives of the state highlight, there's, it's always the friendly countries and, and our brotherly countries um, when they're referring to other non-aligned countries, that it really serves to reinforce this narrative of multiple ethnicities and multiple nations within Yugoslavia living in harmony. So in that sense, he, he explains that the non-alignment was obviously a very fruitful um, policy for Yugoslavia in that era, economically and politically speaking, but that was actually that there was an, another benefit to um, the narrative of non-alignment, which was an internal political narrative. And so I would say that that is one of the reasons why you could see a lot of support for non-alignment within Yugoslavia at the time. And Helena Trenkic is asking, uh, first of all, she's, she's thankful for incre your incredible talk. And she's asking, could you give more details on how many ordinary people saw these videos or these newsreels, including in rural areas, not in more urban settings? I can tell you that the newsreels were printed in the late 1950s. The newsreels were printed in around 800 copies that were circulated in Yugoslavia in cinemas, um, cultural halls, but also mobile cinemas. So the reach of the newsreels would have been great. They were also screened in factories. Um, and so in rural communities, the way that this was resolved was by mobile cinemas. Um, and then I found a document saying how they augmented the number of uh, copies that they were printing because they didn't want people to be watching month old news because obviously if you have a limited number of copies in circulation by the time they get to the rural areas, they're watching news that are a month or two months old. And so by the end of the 1950s, they almost doubled the amount of copies they were producing in order to be able to reach um, more rural areas, if you like, with fresher news. And I have to also ask a question regarding the whole media, uh, media coverage or media use that you were referring to, especially for uh, in the context of Algerian war and in the context of the first non-alignment movement uh, on non-alignment conference in Belgrade. Um, yeah, it's very interesting to me that uh, all these revolutions throughout the newly decolonized right, uh, Africa, for example, uh, were so tightly connected to the media revolution or to the new sort of media used to document those revolutions. So um, do you have any thoughts about connection between these two uh, or like is any social or political revolution uh, actually could be boiled down to the technological revolution in your opinion or do you have any, any comment on that? I don't know, the cause and effect are so simple, but it's obviously very, very clear, you know, the reason I started with the news really are is because in the 1950s, that was a dominant medium. By the mid 1960s, early 1970s, television really comes to the fore as, you know, as the, as the dominant information medium. But what is really interesting is that, you know, by the 1970s, included into the call for a new international economic order, you see call for a new international information order. They were absolutely lucid over the fact that they had to change the flow of information from the kind of center to the periphery. And you can you see the creation of an online news uh, agency in which the Yugoslav news mm. agency, Tanya, played a central role. Um, and by the 1980s, they had also created the non-aligned broadcasting 
committee, if you like, but obviously, you know, by the 1980s, the whole project is kind of destabilized. And then with the end of the Cold War, the whole context is lost. But so I think one, one thing that becomes clear to me is that they knew very clearly that they had to have an information strategy that would, as you say, evolve, evolve, evolve with the technical means of the times. And that without that, you know, the, the battles that they were fighting on the other fronts wouldn't be fruitful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's also interesting to have in mind that these first trips uh, that Tito did were called Voyages of Peace, and um, they would end up with um, deals of selling weapons uh, by Yugoslavia <laughs> to, the, to the countries in Africa. Um, so yeah, as you said, the, this use of uh, soft power or cultural diplomacy by uh, Yugoslav foreign policy uh, was finding its venue pretty much in, in the non-alignment movement. Um, but as, as, a, as an author, maybe as a filmmaker, you can tell us um, uh, what was the unexpected find during your um, so, so far six years of making uh, in this project? Um, I think there were two. One is that I was deeply surprised by how self-aware the politicians are in their use of media. So like I said, this is why I chose all these screenshots where you see them consuming the reports about their own political activities. So for me, I don't know that I had an appreciation. I, obviously my first film was about how Tito used cinema to write the political narrative of Yugoslavia. So I knew about Tito, but just that globally, you know, that this had been um, such a, a key element to their strategy was something that was for me, you know, quite, quite interesting. The second thing is um, when I began working really with Stevan and his diaries and his notes, um, the amount of footage, now we're talking specifically about liberation movements, that was staged so that there is a predefined image of what the liberation movement narrative is and what that should, what a liberation army should look like. And it's true that over time he became a chronicler of the war, but he was really sent there to do a kind of mise-en-scene of the of the war and of the Algerian liberation movement for, for, for the creation of their media narrative. And that, when you begin to deconstruct, because I'm working with his rushes, so I'm working with his unedited footage. So you, you see him repeating scenes, you see him staging scenes, you see him in his diaries saying, I filmed them blowing up the railway today, they didn't get what it needs to look like, we need to do it again. You know, all of these things are absolutely fascinating. Yeah, that does, that does become a, uh a more of a contemporary documentary maker <laughs> uh, sort of uh, strategy than, uh, than the classic like newsreel. Um, um, if, if maybe I could interject, if I could interject here, um, uh, Sasha, with, with there's a question on YouTube that mm. ha kind of takes that in a further direction. And the person on YouTube, um, Olgi Tavlacic, is asking, having in mind that the footage was heavily edited in order to present intended vision of Tito and his foreign policy, do you think the original footage could actually tell a different story? And that seems like something that you're attempting to sort of, um, uh, sort of, um, you know, uh, you know, realize in your own work. And so if I could follow up on that, what sort of formal elements are you, um, you know, looking for? Or how are you imagining uh, the, the sort of simultaneous deconstruction of the original footage with the sort of react, reactivation or refunctioning or, or even reinsertion of the footage into a contemporary context, thinking about the third world and the non-aligned movement and so forth. So the deconstruction, informally speaking, the way that I've been doing this with the film and with the research project is one is uh, simply contextualizing it with the documentation that I found around the creation of the films. You know, when you, when you find the script, that was given to Stevan for the making of Jazeirona, you, it gives you a completely different reading of the images that you're looking at, you know, because you begin to understand the perspective with which he's making, you know, which scenes he's choosing, how he's choosing to stage them. So one is simply contextualizing footage with the documentation surrounding its creation. The second, as I mentioned, is this idea of layering it with a subjective gaze. So you know, there is what was given to him in a script, but then there is what was actually physically feasible in the field. So when Stevan begins to explain the, the complexities of um, having the Algerians, you know, they know he's the presidential cameraman. They don't want to put his life at risk. He needs to film a French aerial attack in order to have a scene for the film. And then he began, it's a, it's a three month negotiation before they agree to take him across the Lin Maurice into Algeria. So, you know, there is also the subjectivity of what was he able to film? 
in a war situation, you know, which heavily impacts what you can see in the footage. Um, and then, like I mentioned, the third, and for me, maybe the most exciting phase of the project, and it's the definitely, you know, it's the most recent one that we've begun, is this idea of layering that footage with narratives, um, perspectives um, of uh, people from the countries where it was filmed. So taking that footage to Algeria and showing it to people like Ferhat Sibera, how were, uh, was already incredible because I was getting his reading on the footage, but showing it to younger generations today in Algeria or in Ghana or in Mali or in Mozambique, which is the, the most recent part of the, the project that we've begun has just opened up an incredible richness of perspectives and readings and um, really kind of the reclaiming of these images. Um, so for me, that's the next step in the project. Uh, there is another question from the audience. Neda Milanova is asking how many, if any, reels were lost after the fall of Yugoslavia? What was their condition when you started the research? Are any of the films created in collaboration for the other countries like Ethiopia and the rest preserved in the archive in their entirety? Great talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, hard to know what was lost uh, because there was a period of chaos in the 1990s. And as I mentioned, also because they were a federal institution without a federation. So they were an institution with no director for a very long time. Um, and it's true that you can see how the, just even the paper archives get um, incomplete as we move towards the end of the eighties and then definitely with the nineties. So it's impossible to say what was lost. Uh, or how much was lost. It's happened to us, you know, many times already that, you know, we'll be looking for outtakes. For example, I was looking for unused material of the Belgrade summit. The inventory, the paper inventory says that there's 35 reels. We only found 26. Whether over time more reels will appear, you know, the, the archive, the, the actual depot is vast. And there are many, many reels in there that are unmarked or they just say non-aligned, but you don't know what's on them. And we haven't had time, you know, five years, we've barely been able to, to begin, if you like, the work. So it's impossible to say what was lost. It's, it could be that it's just misplaced. It could be that it's mislabeled. Um, but that we've not you know, we've, that we've covered a very small path in the identification of everything that is in their holdings, that for sure. Um, it's an institution full of incredibly dedicated archivists, but severely understaffed and underfunded. Of all of the public cultural institutions in Serbia, it has by far the smallest budget. Um, because as I said, the Yugoslav legacy is of no interest to the cur current Serbian government. So. It's not like there is an estate project uh, of the digitalization of their materials. This has all been an individual initiative on our, our part to try and bring the non-aligned um, elements of the collection to light and, and to reuse them. So I, there, I actually don't know the answer to that question. We're still very much digging in the dark. Yeah, thank you for that. Um... There is an interesting question regarding uh, Stefan Labudovic's own cinematic inspirations. Did you, uh, talking to him, um, find out anything more about his own um, models that he followed, who were his filmmakers, favorite filmmakers and filmmaking styles, etc.? Yes, absolutely. I was deeply interested in that. I was, I was obviously, as a filmmaker myself, I was, and, and he was an incredibly talented cameraman. I was deeply curious about what shaped his own filmmaking aesthetics. And um, on an anecdotal level, I can tell you that what most people would assume, I think, which is, you know, Soviet, um, uh, Soviet cinema of the 1930s was absolutely not. In fact, during the Second World War, Stevan had been requisitioned by the Red, Soviet Red Army uh, to be in their photographic units because they saw the work he did in the partisan units and he actually deserted after a few months uh, of being in the Red Army because he felt that they were, their propaganda was too um, obvious, as he used to say. So already that makes him a very, for me at least, it made him a very compelling um, character. Um, and so actually where I think you could trace the cinematic influences on his work kind of most powerfully are Italian neorealism. Um, 
which is not at all surprising because he had spent time in Bari um, towards the end of the Second World War and he often traveled through Italy on his way to Algeria. Um, so he was exposed to a lot of Italian neorealist cinema, but also just being in Yugoslavia, you know, many Italian neorealist filmmakers made films in Yugoslavia in the post-war years, Giuseppe De Santis, for example. And so when you think about the aesthetics of it, Italian neorealism, you, for me, it actually made a lot of sense in decoding Seven's footage. Great, thank you. Thank you for that question as well, Yanis. <laughs> Yanis has another question. Uh, would you ex post facto assess the reality presented in Elabudovich's film as manufactured? How did he cope with the burden of objectivity? I don't think I think you did already tell a lot about yeah. it about staging, but I'll be honest as a if you have anything else to add. Yeah. I'll just be honest that as a documentary filmmaker, concepts of reality and objectivity are not something that I relate to. I don't think they're actually useful in unpacking the work of a documentary filmmaker. So I don't really know that I can answer that question. For me, it has all been about reinscribing the subjectivity into his approach and into his perspective, which is something that I, as a filmmaker, you know, kind of think defines my work. So just, uh, you know, people maybe make the false assumption that because what we do is called documentary, it has something to do with documenting and documentation. But actually, if you go back to the origins of the term, even the, someone who's considered the father of documentary cinema, John Grierson, he said, you know, it's, it's actually really a misnomer and it's going to confuse a lot of people, but for want of a better word, word, let's just call it documentary until we find a better word for it. And they never found a better word for it. But um, I, I wouldn't, um, I think it would be facile to simply associate that with portrayals of reality or objective approaches to seeing the world. Because I think it's, it's misleading. I don't actually think it helps them understand or unlock the footage. Um, and I'm also thinking about your two earlier projects. They do use uh, extensively the music in editing. Um, can you tell us a little bit, if you have any ideas, what kind of music you're thinking of using in your new documentaries? I don't know that I've been thinking about music a lot, but I've been thinking about voice a lot. Um, because the technology of the time means that he filmed silent footage. He only had um, image, he didn't record sound. So a large part of working on this material for me has been this idea of the missing sound. And so obviously I find it kind of incredibly um, symbolic because at the same time we're talking about, you know, a movement that was seeking a voice in international relations that lost that voice, whose voice has been lost. And so for me, the work on this film has really involved how to engage voices, political voices into the soundtrack. And that's something that I've been working on deeply. Um, so music has kind of taken second, you know, the back seat to, to this work on, on finding ways of including audio and, uh, and reactivating that voice, if you like. Mm. But then the question is, will, will these voices use a colonial, lingo franca or they will be in their own languages local languages well the you know depends on how they gave speeches at the time so if you listen to sukarno's speech at the not only summit in belgrade it was in english um nasser's was in arabic modibo keita spoke in french and kruma spoke in english um those are the sound recordings that we have of, of, of their political speeches at the Belgrade summit. So it's pretty much that that influences the, the voices that we can use. If, if I could, I interject a question here, um, Sasha, as well, um, thinking about voices and what you were um, saying about the third part or the final part of the film that you're working on right now, as I understand it. And, and if you, if you could maybe talk a little bit more about it. So you're screening um, films to, um, audiences in Ghana and Mozambique and Algiers and so forth and um, what types of material are you showing them? Are you showing them the newsreels themselves or are you talking about your own work or are you um, bringing in unedited footage and so what, what types of you know sort of um, uh, I guess you know um, uh, exhibition uh, situations are you are you looking at and then how are you documenting them? Are you sort of recording them or maybe interviewing spectators who are seeing this uh, for the first time uh, in general sort of talk about that maybe reinsertion of the contemporary voice and, and how it um, 
so uh, just to distinguish this this part of the project doesn't have anything to do with the film the film is really tracing the story of Stevan Labudovic I see, okay. um, this is really part of the kind of artistic research project that we've called non-aligned newsreels and it's really been this attempt to layer a new reading over the archival images by inviting um, the perspective of the people in the countries where this footage was shot. Yeah. Uh, the way we've been doing this so far is that I show, I try and show a selection of um, unedited footage, so the original outtakes, uh, and it's kind of raw as purest form possible without being um, framed within any kind of political narrative of the time. But then as a kind of second um, step in that process, it's also listening to the edited, you know, kind of ideologically infused um, voiceovers um, and also trying to unpack those and, you know, see whether those communicate in any way or not. And so, yeah, we've been recording these, obviously, because it's such a precious encounter. I mean, for me, it's just precious to be able to witness their encounter with these archives, see how they appropriate themselves of these images how um, they decipher them within their own personal lived experiences, family stories, um, you know, um, national traditions, if you like. And so it's just been a gift to be able to be present um, for this moment of reactivation. And yes, so we've been documenting that with the idea of turning that into a sort of um, performance, performances, if you like, of silent screenings. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Very nice. Yeah, that is interesting because, yeah, you're going from the side of historical document into a way of living, living, living the memory, um, in a way when the personal and um, the subjective become much more prominent. Um, um, Susanna Vuljevic is just having a comment. She's saying this was fascinating. Thank you. One documentary I recommend with reference to this question of voice is Andre Salas' Intervista, which you may already know. And uh, she's adding how the questions of post-communist memory in Albania are addressed here as well. Um, Thank you for the tip. No, I don't, I don't know the problem. Yeah, I'm not familiar with uh, Intervista film as well. Um, Sounds interesting. There's something to check. Mm, absolutely. Um, and maybe a good question for wrapping up uh, is to bring this 1950s, 60s um, media wars into today contemporary moment in social media wars. So another qu question from Yanis Tsiliagakis. Um, what similarity, similarities and differences do you see as a media person and filmmaker from the newsreel information wars of the decades you study? In today's social media wars with shorter blurbs, shorter attention span, and faster turnover news, media, and information cycle. I don't know that I see similarities, but I definitely see a continuity. I think what's interesting to me is that you can trace the origins of the info wars back to the way um, liberation movements of the 1950s and 60s decided to harness media to their strategy. And, you know, this whole idea of um, diplomatic revolutions and information battles that uh, Matthew Conley writes about. So for me, what I'm, what I'm interested in is looking at that trajectory where um, it becomes really interesting is that obviously all of these films that they were filming at the time were, were um, intended for mass media consumption, you know, so they were organized screenings. And when you look at the philosophy of third cinema, and I really think this is the kind of the precursor to third cinema, um, they oftentimes wrote that the screening itself is less important than the discussion that follows. Yeah. So there is, you know, this implicit, um, again, going back to use value, there's a very utilitarian value aside to the films, but what's implicit in it all the time is the collectivity of it. It's the collectivity of its making, the collectivity of its showing and the collectivity of its discussion. And I kind of have a feeling that where we've arrived today with social media is actually a more fragmentation yeah. of the viewing audience and, um, the opposite maybe of an invitation to coll collective group discussion and analysis after after the consumption of the media. So, you know, I see it as a trajectory, but very interesting in how it veers into something else today. I think we're still in information wars, you know, fake news is a continuity of that, if you like, but the mode of consumption I think is no longer collective, not in the sense, and obviously, yes, when you talk about kind of echo chambers that form around certain, yeah. 
um, certain subjects in the culture wars, but um, but not this idea of an invitation to a community collective collective debate around around the film. So um, I would actually really inscribe it more as a kind of um, interesting trajectory to analyze how you know how the harnessing of the media evolved. Again, as you were saying, Alexander, with the evolution of technology. It's yeah, awesome. definitely. The platforms that exist today enable com completely different, um, both distribution and consumption. So mm -hmm. that plays into it. Uh, well, at, least um, we, at least we were able to preserve the event-like status of um, a discussion with an event like this, where we are, <laughs> we, are, we, are, we are online, but yet we are a collective um, we're responding to a presentation on images and thinking about their... Um, their function and their intervention in our daily lives. So, um, great. Yeah. Well, I, I think that we we did touch upon many many different topics, and um, I don't want to also. Uh, I know it's late in Europe <laughs> now, so I don't want to also push. Uh, but if you want to add anything at the end, or Chris, if you have any question at the end, um, please. Uh, share share it with us um, I'll, I'll maybe add just something and then if you have something to say Mila, as well um as i mentioned at the beginning i think that this is a, a fascinating project which really opens up um the true diversity of east central europe and southeastern europe in the communist period and particularly this sort of moment from the 50s through say the 70s um which is sort of after the after world war ii but prior to the sort of um, uh, uptick in Cold War, um, you know, hostility in the 1980s, in which we have this sense of openness, really, um, you know, in, in which new cultural forms, despite, you know, the authoritarian contexts that are in the background and which are not going to go away, which we should keep an eye on, but nevertheless, that there is this, um, these interstices and these, these, um, these connections and these linkages, these networks, these pivots and these relays in which in which um, East Central Europe is really a, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a zone of newness and, and openness and, and something to be to sort of explored um, uh, for its own innovations and its uh, and its contemporary productivity in its own right. Yeah, I'm also glad that that we have um, we have someone like you who is both um, educated as a political scientist and is also <laughs> a maker, a filmmaker and author. Um, so um, you are able to approach uh, probably in your research for the films, you're able to approach subjects from, from all these different backgrounds. Um, so thank you again for, for a wonderful talk and discussion and thank you audience for uh, great questions. Um, and um, no, I think Oh, that was you, Chris. Uh, I, I, wanted to, so, um, I, wanted, I wanted to clap my hands and I was looking for the right icon, but I can't find it in my, <laughs> so I'll just, I'll literally clap my hands instead of okay. doing the, yeah. the, the emoji clap. Thank you for the invitation yeah. and the opportunity to share the work. It was really interesting to be able to discuss afterwards. So thank you for that. Thank you, Mila. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you again. And uh, yeah. I hope to see you everyone uh, next um, next year and next semester for please check our programming um, and um, join our mail, mail list uh, so you get these uh, announcements in advance. Mm -hmm. Thank you Mila again and um, good night. Okay, good, yeah. night. Bye. good night. Good night everyone. Bye bye.